Welcome back. So hopefully you have already reviewed the lesson about the foramen of canals and fissures. So looking at the different holes in the head, um, when you go through those holes, you'll find that there's different cranial nerves or veins or arteries that go through those. And so it's helpful now to look at the actual cranial nerves. So today's lesson will be on the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. In your notes, you're gonna see that some of those cranial nerves have different mnemonic devices. So that's gonna help you remember the 12 pairs because they're in order identified by Roman numeral one down to Roman numeral 12. The thing to think about with cranial nerves is that there's a specific function for each cranial nerve. And that depending on if that nerve is sensory or motor or both will help you to figure out what the function is. Your brain model has the cranial nerves identified along with your nervous system purple model. So you can find the cranial nerves on the brain model. You can also find the cranial nerves on the purple nervous model that we have in lab. And then you'll see some of the cranial nerves on your ear model and also the eye model. And those are the ones that will show up on the final exam. So before we begin, let's talk about the mnemonic devices for cranial nerves. One of the things you'll find in your lab manual is that it says next to each cranial nerve for the brain model, OOO to touch and feel very green vegetables always helps. That's an okay mnemonic device. However, when I look at that mnemonic device, I think, oh, oh, oh man, which one is which? And there's three of them that start off with O. So cranial nerve number one, two, and three all begin with the letter O. Other mnemonic devices may use the previous cranial nerve name. So you will find that two of the cranial nerves historically have other names that were used. And so that can become problematic because sometimes you'll run across a mnemonic device that will have, instead of V, they will say it begins with an A. So vestibular cochlear used to be called auditory. Sometimes accessory is referred to as spinal accessory. So just a heads up, when you Google or look on Wikipedia, because the mnemonic devices are listed there too, they have changed over time. You need to use the most current scientific name for them. Your textbook, which is Saladin, does a very good job of creating a mnemonic device that gives you the first couple letters of each cranial nerve. And I really like that. It's hard to remember, but in a pinch, if you can remember this one, just practice it over and over, it's gonna end up helping you out. And in that textbook, it says, old Opie occasionally tries trigonometry and feels very gloomy, vague, and hypoactive. This gives you the first couple letters of each cranial nerve. Now, looking at these 12 cranial nerves, let's think about their functions. It's gonna help if we know whether they're sensory motor or both. There are mnemonic devices to help you with that as well. One mnemonic device is Sally sells mega monkeys, but her brother sells bigger, better mega monkeys. And that's just meaning that Sally sells really, really big monkeys, but her brother has really, really big, better monkeys, right? So that's an easy one. And it's not that Sally sells seashells, because she doesn't, she sells mega monkeys. And so it's kind of easy to remember this one, but some people find it challenging. So how about some say marry money, but my brother says big business makes money. Or you can get a little past G rated on it and you can say some say marry money, but my brother says big boobs matter more. You have some options there, right? So find a mnemonic device that works for you and stick with it. If it begins with an S, then that's a sensory nerve. And if it begins with an M, that's a motor nerve, meaning that it only has motor components. It's activating a muscle or a gland. If it's sensory, then it's ascending information to the brain, as opposed to motor, which is descending the information. It's coming from the brain to whatever effect or muscle or gland that it needs. Otherwise, it's sending the information up to the brain if it's sensory. So things that are sensory are like taste, touch, eyesight, right? Those are things that we sense and it sends the information on over to the brain. Now, since we know whether it's sensory motor or both, we can look at the name and figure out, all right, is this particular cranial nerve gonna have this particular function? Now that you have a full list in front of you, 
the cranial nerves, whether they're sensory motor or both, we can figure out their function. We're gonna start off with the olfactory nerve because it's cranial nerve number one. Olfactory obviously is above the nasal region and it deals with smell because that makes sense. And it's the sense of smell. You can see the olfactory nerve on the 3D brain model, but you can also see it on the purple model. So let's look at the brain model. You will notice on the brain model, you have your frontal lobe here, and underneath the frontal lobe, you have your olfactory tracts. That makes sense that they come up through that cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone at the olfactory foramina, and they attach. Looking at your second cranial nerve, you have optic. Optic is sensory as well. Remember, Sally cells. So both of those are sensory, number one and number two. And so optic, obviously we're thinking the optic area, that's gonna end up dealing with the sight. When you look for your optic nerve on your brain model, you're gonna find the optic nerve here near the pituitary gland. This is your pituitary gland. These are your optic tracts, the one there. And so those are the optic nerves. Number three is unique in that you actually are gonna to have to split the brain model apart. When you have split the brain model apart, you will see that there is a seahorse shape inside the brain. Do you see the face of the seahorse? This would be the nose of the seahorse and the belly of the seahorse. If you look closely near the chin of the seahorse, you will notice that there's a number here. And this number is going to represent cranial nerve number three, also beginning with an O, but it's oculomotor Motor telling me that it deals with movement. Oculo telling me that it deals with the eyes. The oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number three, is gonna help with eye movement. Specifically, it activates four of your extraocular eye muscles. You can see the extraocular eye muscles in the diagram to the left. Those extraocular eye muscles, there are six of them. You have four that are rectus muscles that are gonna go off of anatomical positioning. So a superior and inferior, a lateral and a medial. You then have two oblique muscles, one on top, so it's a superior oblique and one below, which is an inferior oblique. Four of them that are innervated by oculomotor include the ones identified here. Two of the extraocular eye muscles will be innervated by other nerves that we will get to shortly. So here's an interesting tip for you. Of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, take a guess at how many of them actually deal with the eyes. So half of your cranial nerves deal with the eyes. They may allow for sight like optic, or they may allow for motor function with the eyes, movement of them, or some other sensory component, such as feeling. Half of them deal with the eyes. Thinking that half deal with the eyes, trochlear should be an easy one to figure out. Trochlear is going to allow for eye movement. Because it allows for eye movement, specifically what it does is it allows the eyes to rotate up and back into the eye socket. Where you will find trochlear on the brain model is at the chest of the seahorse. So if you look closely, you will notice that there is a number here. It's identified as 114, and that's going to be your trochlear nerve. Because the trochlear nerve allows the eye to work as a pulley and rotates the eye up, which extraocular eye muscle will it innovate? It's going to innovate the superior oblique muscle. The next cranial nerve we will discuss is trigeminal. Trigeminal, tri tells me that it branches into threes. You can see this on your purple model as well. It is identified by E1, E2, and E3. Trigeminal is unique because it branches like this. It then forms other nerves. What's interesting about trigeminal is how it branches and where it does. So you'll notice on the side of your face, if you did this, that is how trigeminal will branch. It forms an ophthalmic, a maxillary, and a mandibular branch. You can see trigeminal on the brain model. If you look closely, it forms at 117. It's this hump here. What you may have noticed already is that the cranial nerves start off at Roman numeral one closer to the front 
of the brain. And as we progress down towards the base of the brain, we are going to progress closer to number 12. We are now to abducens. Abducens gives me a little bit of a hint right there with the name. Abducting is what it reminds me of. And when you abduct something, you take it away. So here, abducens is a motor nerve. And because it's a motor nerve, and we know that half of the nerves deal with the eye, it's logical to think that abducens will abduct the eye. So when you look at your extraocular eye muscles, abducens will pull the eye lateral. It's going to allow you to look to the side. You can see abducens on the brain model, and I like to think of it as being at the abs of the seahorse. So if you look at the abs of the seahorse, here at 118, you have abducens. Now this is a good spot to show you that on the other side of the brain model, it has Roman numerals to identify which cranial nerve we're talking about. The catch is that sometimes you may end up with half a brain. And if you're not used to working with half a brain, it's time to start getting used to it. So if you only get half of the brain that has these numbers and the numbers have been changed to something else, then we need to keep that in mind, that we can't just look off of these numbers to figure out what they are. We need to remember that ab is at the abs of the seahorse. All right, you see that little line there? That's what we're looking at. Now it's time for facial. So facial deals with a lot of things. It can deal with taste. It can also deal with movement. So when you looked back at those list of mnemonic devices for what it can do, then you probably notice that it's both because it has sensory and motor components. Facial is closer to like the hip of your little hippocampus there, the seahorse. So if you look at it, you will notice right here, this line, it's right above the olive, and that's gonna be facial. On the other side, facial is identified by number 119. All right, so we're to the part of this model where it gets a little confusing. I'll walk you through it. So vestibular cochlear is going to be your first cranial nerve when you're near the like brainstem area. So if you look here by the olive, there are these humps. Do you see these? Each of these will be a cranial nerve. On this side of your model, you will see that they're identified by the Roman numeral. And when we flip the model around, they're identified by numbers. The catch with this model is that the numbers in the cranial nerve Roman numeral is not always in the same place. So that's why it can be confusing. So let's look at that. Your first one on the brainstem area is vestibulocochlear. Vestibulo tells me that it deals with equilibrium and cochlear tells me that it's dealing with hearing. So if you look here, we have Roman numeral eight, at this, pointing to this hump. And when you flip to the other side, it is this top hump here, and it's going to be identified with number 120 written over here on the side. Your second one is cranial nerve number nine. So next to the olive here, we have cranial nerve number nine. Cranial nerve number nine is identified by number 121, which is actually written below it here. So cranial nerve number nine is glossopharyngeal. Glosso tells me tongue, pharyngeal tells me pharynx. So it makes sense that this portion is going to allow for swallowing. It also allows for taste in the back third of your tongue. So facial allows for taste on the anterior two thirds and glossopharyngeal allows for the back third. Here you have cranial nerve 10. It's on this hump here. If you flip over, you will see that what identifies that hump is this number here, which is 122. 122 should be on the hump above where the number is located. Cranial nerve number 10 is vagus. I like to think that everybody loves vagus. It gets 10 stars. Vagus would be located here. 
the last hump on the brainstem region here should be identified with number 123. The Roman numeral is actually above it. It's XI. Cranial nerve 11 is spinal accessory, also known as accessory. It's going to allow for neck movement. It is a motor nerve. Here's where people come into a little bit of an issue. On this side, it has Roman numeral XI in between these, so Roman numeral 11. And on this side, it identifies the number at 122. But if you look at your lab manual, it'll identify 122 as vagus, which is cranial nerve 10 and not 11. So be cautious when going through here. Remember that each hump coming down, we start at seven, eight, nine, 10, end at 11 here. And you're probably saying, well, what happened to hypoglossal? Hypoglossal, you have to hop back up. So from here, we're gonna hop back up to the olive here, and we are now at hypoglossal. Hypoglossal tells me below the tongue. Hypo below or beneath, and glosso telling me tongue. So hypoglossal has motor function, and it's going to allow for the tongue movement. On your brain model, Hypoglossal is identified at number 124, right here at the olive. I hope these have been helpful for you. So if you still have questions about cranial nerves and maybe what holes they go through, look back at the foramina canals and fissures video. And if, if you're looking for nervous system videos, just check them out. I have plenty more posted.